I'd also like to thank the Awatuki Rec Center and their staff. And so last year I came and visited with Mary and I had my outline of the things I would like to present for education uh, for seniors and seniors' families. And we weren't quite ready to do it, COVID, the holidays, whatever. So on the very same day I was going to call Mary, she called me in January. And she said, would you come back and show me what you've got? And so I put together my outline and my plan for everything and brought it. And she presented it to the board and they approved it. So first I'd like to thank the board for approving it. And then also they provided the books to you guys tonight. They paid for those books. And I, yeah, that's a big deal. Now I, I was able to provide them at cost because this is not my per my profit thing. This is not my deal. This is my give back. But I wanted you to know that they did that for you too. And they provided this lovely room and the refreshments and the people that put the tables up and take the tables down. So let's give them one more hand. Thank you. All right. So um, people ask me why did I do this. Um, I did this because I've helped so many people get through different transitions in so many ways. And I feel like there was a lack of education. And each one had a hiccup or multiple hiccups. And I thought, this is ridiculous. If we would research this and learn how to do this a little better, then we would execute better. And we are all very smart people, so we can learn to do this. So my goal with Transitions with Dignity is to equip and educate every single person, every single senior and their families, so to empower them to make future lifetime goals. And those are lifestyle goals. Where do you want to live? How do you want to live? All of those kinds of things. And you need enough information to learn how you can reach your goal. And everyone's goal is going to be different. And every story is going to be different. So that's what I did. So it's also my goal to provide seniors with access to smart and reliable people and honest people if you need help with something. And so you've got my phone number and you call and you say, Carol, I need that red couch moved out of my house and I don't have somebody to do it. And it's going to my sister's house. And I will have the person that will come load up the couch and get it to your sister's house. Now, you'll be charged a nominal fee, but it's not awful and they're honest and so I, I'm that person for you guys. Okay, I told you I'm a seniors real estate specialist. That's a big difference from being like the first time home buyer specialist because I work with people like Ron, I work with people in financial planning, I work with people in taxes. So I learn all the implications this is going to have for buying and selling as a senior. And so there's a lot of times I'll be able to guide you to the people, or at least know you should be looking and talking to somebody um, about something. And so that's the kind of thing I do there. I always like to do a little market update just on our A5044. February of last year, we sold 33 houses, or we had 33 active listings. This time we have 30. You'll notice each time it is smaller. New listings were 51 last year, 47 this year, sold was the same. What that means is it's still a really, really tight market. And so I would like you to know that because markets change. Now the average sales price, if you look at that, last year was 440,000. In one year's time, it's jumped to 533,000. That is a 21% increase. The Phoenix market price for the last three years has increased 25% per year. That has never happened before. It's just crazy. It won't continue to do that, but it is right now. Um, average days on market went from 31 days on market to 29, so properties are moving quite quickly. Some people aren't even looking at them before they come. Um, anyway, so that's kind of our market there. So if you want to know what the value of your house is and you'd like a free current um, analysis of your house, there's no obligation. I'm in the back at the end, there's a, a, just a sign up, just sign up your name and I'll do an evaluation of your house and I'll come over 
take a look at it, and it's a snapshot in time. That's all it is. To, next month, it may not even be that price. That's how crazy things are. For sure, in six months, it definitely won't be. So, a snap in time. Okay, so with that, I want to go on to our first guest speaker, and I'm so excited about this. Um, Ron Adams has been my estate attorney for many years, and I think he's just done such a great job for me. And so he's got your financial benefits in mind, and along with the emotional benefits that go with that. But I wanted to tell you, I have to read this because it's so important. Um, Ron is East Valley's only best lawyer in America honoree in the trust and estate category. That's Best Lawyers, Best Law Firms, U.S. News, and World Reports 2021. And he is part of Hoops, Adams, and Sharper. And his phone number is there, 480-345-8845. And you can call him for a free consultation. And if you, he's standing right here, he'll talk to you, he'll give you his card. Um, this is the caliber of people we bring into this. This is why you want to attend, because you're going to learn from the person that really does it the best. And with that, let's give Ron a hand. Well, good evening. Good evening. Carol, thank you for that introduction. You're welcome. Uh, as Carol mentioned, I've known and worked with her for many years now. Uh, and I've read the book that you all have on your table there, and I would encourage you to do the same. It's full of great information. So definitely take a look at that. So as Carol mentioned, I'm Ron Adams. I've been an estate planning lawyer for almost 33 years now. Uh, much longer than I would have expected at this point. Um, and what I'm going to talk to you about tonight is uh, some general kind of estate planning concepts. Some things you might think about uh, as uh, you look at your own existing plans or need to put a plan together, and some of the differences between different kinds of plans you can look at. But one thing I want to encourage you is I definitely want to be able to answer any questions you might have as we go along. We don't need to wait till the end to address any questions you may have, so feel free as I'm talking to raise your hand and if I can see it, we'll answer the question. So let me start with uh, this. Uh, is, I, mean, I want to just mention briefly uh, the existing tax structure from a planning perspective. This year, uh, estate taxes, you know, what they call the death tax, as they're writing about in newspaper articles, really does not affect very many people. Right? You each have the ability to leave over $12 million estate tax free. Together, $24 million for a married couple. Uh, and uh, because of a law that went into place well, probably 10 years ago now, uh, even if you had an estate that was over, say, $12 million, right, there's this concept called portability, which means, as I mentioned, each spouse within a married couple has a $12 million exemption. And if a spouse who dies first does not use their exemption at their death by leaving everything to their surviving spouse, for example, that surviving spouse can tack on the 12 million that the first to die spouse didn't use. So the surviving spouse can leave 24 million in state tax free. So, you know, with those kinds of numbers, it really doesn't affect very many people these days. Now, I will say, uh, you know, back a year ago, last October, September, uh, the Build Back Better Act that was being proposed by the Biden administration was going to change that pretty significantly and drop this exemption potentially to three and a half million dollars each. Still a big number and it still is not going to affect the majority of Americans. Uh, but it was a big change. I'll tell you the the bigger change that would have impacted a lot of people as part of that act is uh, for income tax purposes. I, I don't know how many of you are aware of this, but at your death, your assets get a step up in basis for income tax purposes. 
which means if I own a, uh, say a rental property, a house, uh, not my primary residence, but separate rental property, and I bought it for $200,000 and today it's worth $500,000. Well, if I sell that property while I'm alive, right, I have $300,000 of gain to pay tax on. Upon my death, even if my wife survives me, her basis in that property is now $500,000 not the 200 that we bought it for. So if she sells it the next day, or as long as it's not worth more than 500, she pays no tax on that sale. She would only pay tax on the difference between the 500 and future appreciation. Or upon her death, right? Now if that same rental property is appreciated to 700,000, our kids inherit it with a basis of 700,000. And because we're a community property state, all of the assets, at least all of the community assets, get that step up in basis, not just my share, my 50% of the community assets if I die first. The initial proposal in the Build Back Better Act was gonna do away with that step up in basis issue. That really would have impacted people because it applies to everything, real estate, you know, mutual funds, stocks and bonds, every asset gets a step up in basis of death. Not retirement plans or you know, 401ks, IRAs, uh, but uh, non-qualified assets do. And if that was eliminated, that would have impacted a lot more people. Uh, in the current proposal, and as by October of last year, all of those changes were dropped uh, from the Build Back Better Act. So it doesn't look like there's gonna be any changes, at least in the reasonably foreseeable future of the estate tax. Uh, I will say though, under existing law, Come 2026, if Congress doesn't change it, uh, the exemption will drop from $12 million today, index for inflation, so it'll keep going up each year, uh, but back down to about $6 million each. Uh, so that the existing law sunsets January 1 of 26 without some other action. Yes? Uh, upon sunset, will affordability still continue? That's my understanding, that there's no impact on the portability issue, because the portability issue pre-existed the increase to uh, you know, where we are today. Uh, it, back when it was about three and a half million each, I think in 2009 or so, might have been 2012, uh, when portability came around. So yeah, it should, the portability issue should still apply. Um, oh, one other thing I just wanted to mention here, uh, the annual exclusion. So, uh, let me explain it this way. I have a $12 million estate tax exemption. I can leave $12 million of death with no tax payable. During life, I can give away $12 million and not pay a tax, a gift tax, right? But now, if I did that, if I had $12 million, let's say, and I gave it to my son today, I would file what's called a gift tax return. It's an IRS form 709, and I would show this year I gave away $12 million. Well, if I died next year and the exemption was still $12 million, I wouldn't have any left. I would have used it up, right? So any amount I use, I eat in during my life with lifetime gifts. I eat into my estate tax exemption at death. Except for gifts I can give to anybody that are not more than $16,000 per year this year. So I can give 100 people $16,000 a piece and not use up any of my estate or gift tax exemption. So uh, that number's gone up each year. Last year it was 15,000, this year it's 16,000. Uh, and for example, my wife and I could join in a gift, uh, say to our son, uh, for $32,000 uh, without using up any gift or estate tax exemption. Does that make any sense at all? Yeah. So if you were to give 16,000 to anyone, would they pay taxes on that? Uh, good question. No. No. So, and remember this too, right? The gift tax is not a gift on the recipient, it's a gift, it's a tax on the giver. So let's say I have zero exemption left and I made a gift of, you know, $100,000 to my son. Um, I pay the tax on that $100,000 gift. It's tax-free to the recipient, 
right? And at 40%, that'd be $40,000 to give away $100,000. Uh, but, uh, yeah, so it's, it's tax-free to the recipient. It's a gift. Uh, and, and no matter how much it is, I could give $12 million to it, right? Use my entire $12 million exemption. He wouldn't pay any tax on it. And neither would I if I used my $12 million gift in the state tax exemption. But any more I gift, gifted during life or a death, I would pay tax. Yeah. Any other questions about that? Yeah. A question uh, when the present law sunsets. Mm -hmm. And you want to give $10 million away. And you do it and you file your tax return saying you give it away. And then you get another 5000 or so and you die. How does that turn into this new law? How do they correlate being able to give 12000 or 10000 or $10 million away and then yeah. a new law comes along? How does that all right. come right. to die? Good question. So uh, last year, towards the end of last year, right, when, when we're thinking that the exemption might drop to $3.5 each, right? It's, it's going to sunset. Total, total of $7 million together. Husband and wife. And say I had a client that had, you know, $20 million. Well, it definitely would have made sense to give away as much of that $20 million as they could, right? Because this year, if the law had gone into effect, they would have lost the ability to give all that money away, right? It would have been part of their estate and death for estate tax purposes. So the short answer is, if I do that, if I gave away 20 million last year, and this year the combined exemption was 7 million, I would have used it all up last year. So I would still have zero left now, uh, coming into this year. Is that the question? Well, they don't go back and say, hey, you, no. the law changed, and if, if you give it away. Right, it's not retroactive. Uh, so it, it, uh, it only applies when it applies as of, yeah. Now, it, it could have been retroactive in the sense that if it went into place, you know, June of this year, retroactive to January 1, but it wouldn't have affected prior years. Okay. Yeah. You. What's different between the, the $16,000 gift pot of money and the $20 million yep. pot of money? I mean, is it, what? <laughs> Right. Difference. So here, here's, here's the big difference. So let's say I gave away $20,000, just me, right? So technically, I'm 4,000 over the annual exclusion, right. which means next year I would have to file a gift tax return with the IRS and show I used up $4,000 of my $12 million exemption. As long as the number's 16,000 or less, I don't have to do anything. I don't have to do any tax filing. I don't have to use up any exemption. So if you want to increase your gift, then you can use part of your exemption. Jumbo. Sure. And you have to file for that. Right. I have to file to show I've used up some of my exemption. But if it, again, 16,000 or less, I don't have to do anything. No tax filing, no exemption use. I can just give that away. Anything else? All right, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, trusts and wills, and what the differences are primarily, uh, and how they, to some degree, integrate with each other, but what the primary differences are. So think of it this way. I mean, one potential advantage of putting a trust in place, and when I talk about a trust, what I'm talking about is what's called a living trust, or a revocable trust. Uh, contrasted to an irrevocable trust. So a living trust or irrevocable trust just means at any point in time after I create it, I can change it, right? There's nothing written in stone about it. With an irrevocable trust, I can't change it. Once it's in place, that's it. It says what it says, and I don't have the ability to change it. Um, so why, why would I do that? Um, well, one, if I didn't understand what I was doing, I might do that, and I've seen that a number of times. Um, but more importantly, if I had an estate tax issue and I wanted to give assets away to my kids and grandkids, 
then I could create an irrevocable, but I didn't want to give it to them directly, right? Because my child and her daughter are spendthrifts and they can't manage money. So I didn't want to give it to them directly. I could set up a trust for their benefit, irrevocable, put assets in it and give them away. Now, when I do that, I've in fact given them away, meaning I cannot benefit by them anymore. Only my child and grandchildren can benefit by it. And I can't change that trust once it's created. But I've removed assets from my estate for tax purposes, and my kids and grandkids and so forth can benefit by that. Here we're talking about a radical trust, which is just it's an estate planning tool, not a tax planning tool. Right? So one of the differences between having just a will or a trust uh, is probate. Right? I can avoid probate with a trust if I do it right, and I'll talk about that in a, in a minute. But a trust entails a lifetime transfer. And what I mean by that is a trust only works, at least for probate avoidance purposes, to the extent that once I've created it, I've moved all my assets into it. So those assets are not in my name anymore. They're in the name of the Adams Living Trust. Right? So I've got to deed any real estate I own to the Adams Living Trust. I've got to go open up bank accounts in the name of the Adams Living Trust. Now it used to be, well I say that, trust accounts, bank accounts, investment accounts, brokerage accounts, right? My social security number is still the tax identifier for those accounts. A living trust, unlike an irrevocable trust, does not get its own tax identification number. My social security number is the tax ID number for the trust. It does not file a separate income tax return like an irrevocable trust would. All right, so it's still just me, this living trust. Now most banks, virtually all banks, uh, a number of years ago, Right? I would go into the bank, I'd say, I've got this trust and I need to move my bank accounts into the name of my trust. And they'd say, okay. And they would go in and they would just change the name on my existing accounts to the Adams Living Trust. They don't do that. They make you open up new accounts in the name of the trust. And then you gotta close your personal accounts, move them over into the new trust account. Not a huge deal. But if I've got a lot of direct deposits going into those personal bank accounts, if I've got payments coming out of them automatically, I've got to change all that now when I open up a new trust account. But the trust only works for probate avoidance purposes if I go through that process. If I, in my lifetime, transfer my assets over into the name of the trust. The only assets that I would not do that with are the ownership of any retirement plans or IRAs, right? Only individuals can own IRAs or retirement or be a participant in an employer-sponsored retirement plan. My trust can. So I would not change the ownership of those. There may be some circumstances, and I'll talk about this in a minute, where I might name my trust, or at least parts of it, as a beneficiary of an IRA or retirement plan, but not the ownership. And my cars. I'm not going to change my cars over to the trust with this exception. Uh, a few months ago, I was working with a guy that owned a McLaren. I didn't really know what a McLaren was until I looked it up. Uh, you know, it's a $250,000 car. I gotta move that over to trust. Okay? It's, it's too much in value to be left outside of the trust. It would require a probate if I didn't do it. But I'll tell you something better when dealing with the cars is, uh, Department of Motor Vehicles now has a transfer on death form right on their website. You can print out and fill out, it says, something happens to me, this car goes to this person. Uh, so we use those quite a bit, even if uh, it's to transfer the car at death into the client's living trust. Uh, so that's a handy form. Only works if your vehicle is in just one name though can't be jointly owned. So if it's, you know, John and Jane Smith, or John or Jane Smith, or John and or Jane Smith, won't work. Only works that form with one name on the title. Uh, let, me, let me 
talk, well, I'll, I'm going to talk about the, these qualified plan beneficiaries in a minute. Um, the other thing I'm going to talk about in a minute deals with incapacity planning and how to potentially protect beneficiaries of your estate from creditors, divorcing spouses, other potential creditors that may come after your children or grandchildren as beneficiaries of your estate plan. So wills, let me talk about this for a minute. If all I have is a will, a last will and testament, or I have nothing at all, which means I died what's called intestate, right, without a will. In which case, by the way, Arizona state law dictates who inherits your assets if you die intestate. And now let me mention one thing about that, because this has come up a few times. Second marriage situations. If I'm in a second marriage, and let's say I have kids from a prior marriage that are not my wife's kids, and I don't have any estate plan in place, and I die, well, you, know, you would think my then wife would inherit what we own, right? No, she doesn't, right? My kids get my half of all of the community property that she and I might have. Well, if we've been married, you know, 20 or 30 years, everything we own is probably community property. Well, she doesn't get that half. My kids do. So what happens if I die and now she owns, right, half our house with my kids, who never really liked her a whole lot anyway, right? Or, no, that's not the case. They love my second wife. Uh, but that's, that can be a real potential problem. I've seen that arise a number of times. But that's what happens if you leave it up to Arizona state law to dictate who inherits your assets. And that's what happens if you die with no estate plan whatsoever. Uh, so I talked a little bit about probate, but let me talk about the process. Because if all I have is a will, or I have nothing at all, it necessarily means my estate's going to go through probate at my death. Now, as between a married couple, though, that probate typically does not have to happen until the second spouse dies. And here's why. How we own things is more important than what my will says, or what my trust says for that matter. So let's say that she and I own everything jointly. Right? All of our bank accounts are joint, our investment accounts are joint, the house is joint tenants with right of survivorship or community property with right of survivorship. My, I could have a will that says, upon my death, everything goes to my kids. Doesn't matter, they don't get anything. Right? If everything's owned jointly with my wife, she gets it all. If she's the beneficiary of my IRAs, she gets those. She's the beneficiary of my life insurance, she gets that. So, if that's the case, and that's how all of our assets are structured, then upon the death of the first to die spouse, the surviving spouse just gets it all without going through a probate. But if I've got some assets sitting over here, a bank account, say that's just in my name, or business ownership, right? She and I started this business a long time ago, but all the stock's just in my name or the membership interest of this limited liability company we own is just in my name. Well, at my death, she can't get to my ownership, her, my half, without doing a probate. So, you know, there's, there's a risk that this probate might still have to happen on the death of the first spouse if I haven't structured everything right. So it avoids probate and goes to her without a trust. Um, so, some of the problems with probate. The way, you know, let's say I've named my son as the personal representative under my will, the executor under my will, Arizona, it's called a personal representative. I died, and he needs to open this probate because my wife died years before, and so everything I own is just in my name at my death. Well, he does that, by taking my original last will and testament, keep that in mind, a copy of a will can be probated, but it's much harder to do it than the original last will and testament.
has that. And he files that will with the court with a bunch of other paperwork to get officially appointed the personal representative of my estate. And he gets this piece of paper called Letters Testamentary that he can now take around to my bank, to you know, any investment accounts I hold, and collect those assets. Well, that process of, of him getting appointed as the personal representative doesn't take a whole lot of time. That can be done within a week or 10 days or so. But the process that he's got to then go through before he can close out this probate in the simplest of cases, takes a good nine to 12 to 15 months to get through. And it's not because he's having to do a bunch of stuff every day for nine months, let's say. It's because it's a court process. So the court rules say, okay, personal representative, you do these things. And then you gotta wait four months before you can do the next set of things. And then you gotta wait two months after the next set of things before you can do the next set of things. So it takes time to, to get through. Now it's not like things are locked up within the estate during that period of time. My son is my personal representative. He can pay my bills and he can do things during that period of time. He just has to make sure he's holds on to enough that all the creditors of my estate get paid before the beneficiaries get a distribution out of it. Because if he doesn't, any creditors that I owe money to can go after him personally to get that back. Uh, and trying to claw that back from his sister to pay those creditors is not gonna be an easy process. So, so yeah. So is there a minimum for probate? It's a good, yeah. it's a good question. So there is, there is. If the value of all of my personal property bank accounts, investment accounts, cars, you know, whatever it is, is worth less than $75,000, then there's a different alternate mechanism I could use called the small estate affidavit to collect assets in lieu of doing the probate. For real estate, if the assessed value for property tax purposes is less than $100,000, Less liens, so if there's you know, mortgage against the property, that comes off of the assessed value, not fair market value, assessed value for property tax purposes, which is gonna be a lot less than the fair market value. Then there's a small estate affidavit that can be used for real estate. It's a different process because for real estate, I still have to do a filing with the court, uh, get a certified copy of this filing and record with the county recorder that filing. But that there is a process I can use in lieu of probate. If the real estate's under 100,000 and personal property's under 75,000. Uh, otherwise, I gotta do a probate. Um, another potential issue with having to open up a probate estate, it's a public process because it's a court process. So anybody that wanted to know what I owned, how much it was worth, who was gonna get it, when they were gonna get it, that's all public record. They can go to the courthouse and look that up. But I suspect before too long, get it online. Uh, they can't do that yet. But, but the court filing is public record, so anybody can go ask for that. Uh, and like I said, it takes time to do if I have to go through this probate process. So we talked a little bit about married couples, things jointly owned or beneficiary designations to my spouse. I'm going to avoid probate. And the strategies to avoid, that's kind of what I mean, is uh, if I structured everything right, it avoids probate. But let me throw this big caveat out there, right? Because I see this a lot. Uh, and look, it, it, it makes sense, sort of, to do, but here, here's, the, here's the event, right? My wife's gone. I'm still alive, and I'm thinking, well, Right? If I add, then I've got a son and daughter. My son lives here, my daughter lives out of state. So in all my brilliance, I'm thinking, well, here's what I'll do. I'll add my son to my bank account. Right? I'll add him to my investment account. I'll put him on the deed to my house. So now when I die, no probate has to happen because it's jointly owned with my son. 
Well, that avoids propane, sure enough. Raises some other problems, right? I, I do that, and my son causes a car accident and gets sued. Well, now I got a big problem. All of my accounts, all of my assets are subject to those creditor claims. Well, let me throw this out at you. Uh, more good news. Effective this year, the Arizona elect, well, let me say it this way. Forever, Arizona has had what's called a homestead exemption for your primary residence, right? Used to be $100,000. First, no, $150,000. First $150,000 of equity, yeah, I'll throw one fifty. Uh, in my house is protected from creditor claims. So if I got sued, right, they couldn't foreclose on that creditor could not foreclose on my house. They could not force me to sell it as long as the equity was not more than one hundred fifty thousand dollars. And if they did force a sale because the equity was more than that, I at least got to keep the first one hundred fifty thousand dollars from the sale proceeds. The Arizona legislature last year, effective this year, raised that number from 150,000 to 250,000. Okay, great. In that same legislation, they did away with any exemption for creditor claims. So if I get sued, judgment gets entered against me, right? That creditor can take all of the equity of my house. I get. I get nothing, I get no protection. Well, up to the amount of their judgment. But, uh, so anyway, be, beware of that. There is no longer essentially a homestead exemption. Uh, even though they raised the number, they took away the exemption, at least for creditor claims and judgment claims. Uh, okay, oh, let me, let me go back to the other problem with, so I, I put my son on my bank accounts, my investment accounts, the house to avoid probing. He gets sued, that's a problem for me. Another potential problem, another problem is, I die, he inherits everything. My will says, split everything 50-50 between my son and daughter. Well, she doesn't get any of it. Right? He gets it all because all my assets are jointly owned with him. And even if, in his generous heart, and he actually is a generous guy, he wanted to share half with his sister, now he's got a gift tax problem. Right? He can't give her more than 16000 a year without needing him to give to the state tax exemption or filing a gift tax return. So that's not the way you want to do it. Um, I will say, though, in smaller estates, one way you can avoid probate without necessarily creating a trust is to do pay-on-death designations on my bank account. Right? I could go into my bank and I could do a pay-on-death that says, on my death, 50% goes to my son, 50% goes to my daughter, or whoever I wanted it to go to. I can do that with brokerage accounts, bank accounts, virtually anything. Um, IRAs, 401ks, I can just name them 50-50 as the beneficiaries. Um, so, and in Arizona and actually a lot of states now, we have what's called a beneficiary deed for real estate. So I can record a deed that says, upon my death, this property goes to these people in whatever percentages I want to say. Uh, as long as that deed is recorded with the county recorder before I die, no probate has to happen for the real estate. It just goes to the people I've named in the beneficiary deed. Is there a dollar amount that it can't exceed? No, no. That could be a $10 million property. I could do a beneficial deed for it. Um, now, depending on what the estate tax looks like, I may have a, still have a estate tax issue, but uh, for purposes of inheritance, I don't have a problem. Yeah? Um, okay, the person who you have on your house, the beneficiary deed, if there's anything remaining that you owe on that house, that person has to fulfill that obligation. Of course. Meaning, uh, if I've got a lien against my house, whether it's because of a reverse mortgage or a standard mortgage, right, that, whoever inherits that property is gonna take subject to the lien. Uh, so, yeah, it's still, the lien still has to be paid, the mortgage still has to be paid. Yeah. Oh, 
what we're doing like all together. Meaning, if I record a beneficiary deed on the property to my two kids, as soon as I die, they own it, right? Subject to the reverse mortgage and the lien, which is going to need to get paid off. But they own the property; they can sell it. Yeah. Um, if I have a, uh, a joint account with my mother because she's elderly and I'm mm -hmm. paying bills for her, does that mean then if she incurs, you know, uh, like debt? Well, you're, you're not personally responsible. To the extent you, you have contributed money to that joint account, yeah, that account is liable for that debt. Okay, so it, it would only be the accounts that are actually in joint that would be at risk. Would yeah, I mean, your, your accounts in just your name, okay. you're not liable for your mother's debt, right? Okay. I mean, to the extent you inherit from her, the inheritance is liable for that debt. Right, right, right. Uh, but if one just, um, you know, have a joint checking account just to pay bills yeah. for her, then uh, I don't, you know, I'm not responsible should a creditor, creditor come after her for, let's say, medical or whatever. Only to the extent you put money in that account. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Anything else here? Um, so let me, let me talk, uh, uh, again, let's kind of move back a little bit to the difference between trusts and wills. So one big difference, as I mentioned, is this probate issue. And if I create a trust and I've retitled my assets into the name of my trust, I, no probate's gonna have to happen at my death. So that's one big difference between the two. A second difference is how you deal with incapacity. A will only talks about what happens when I die. Right? So when I die, here's where what I own goes. Here's where it goes. Doesn't say anything about my during my lifetime. A trust, on the other hand, works like a will in the sense of it says, when I die, here's who inherits my assets. But it's also a lifetime instrument. So it also talks about how it works while I'm alive, how it works if I become incapacitated, and ultimately how it works upon my death. Well, if all I have is a will, the instrument that I'm gonna to use to deal with this issue of what happens if I become incapacitated is a financial power of attorney, or a durable power of attorney, or in our practice we call it a general power of attorney. But it essentially says, if I become incapacitated, here's who can step up and take over for me, can do things for me, both financial and personal. And by personal, I mean things like dealing with the IRS or the Social Security Administration, government agencies, right? What about I'm incapacitated because of a car accident that's not my fault and a lawsuit needs to be filed on my behalf? Well, my agent under my power of attorney can do that. The, the issue that can come up using a financial durable power of attorney are twofold. So one is, invariably, this power of attorney is gonna say, it becomes effective if I become incapacitated. Now, it doesn't have to say that. You can make a financial power effective as soon as you sign it, all right? This power of attorney is effective upon my signature. I mean, you can do that, and it's sometimes not a bad idea to do that, but remember, this power of attorney can be kind of a dangerous instrument, right? If I name my son as the agent under my power of attorney, and it's effective immediately, and he decides he wants to rip me off, well, he's got the power to do it, right? He can go to my bank, he can go wherever, collect my assets and take them for himself. Not legally, but practically, so it typically says it's effective if I become incapacitated. And usually we'll say, 
And I'm incapacitated if a doctor writes a letter that says so. It says, for these reasons, Ron can no longer manage his personal or financial affairs. Well, if I've got a diagnosed issue, early stage Alzheimer's, dementia, I've got a diagnosed cognitive issue. And my family and I are working with a neurologist. They could probably get him or her to write a letter that says, for these reasons, Ron can no longer manage his affairs. But when that's not the case, and there's a huge gray area there, sometimes it cannot be so easy for the family to find a doctor to undergo that evaluation, do the test, make the determination, and write a letter. And even if they can, it takes a while to do. And, and the problem that comes up that I've seen time and again is, I'm having cognitive issues. I immediately become a target for financial exploitation. All of a sudden, friends and family are contacting me. I need to borrow this, I need that. And I don't know any better, I'm saying great, I'm here, I'm taking it. If I've got a long gap period there where my family can't get me declared incapacitated, that can sometimes be hard to shut off, that financial abuse. But that's what the power of attorney says. It's effective upon my incapacity, and I'm incapacitated if a doctor writes a letter and says so. The second potential problem is the law says I can create this financial power of attorney. I can name somebody to take over upon my incapacity. But there is nothing in the law that says my bank, or Merrill Lynch, or, you know, or Raymond James, or Edward Jones, that they have to accept the power of attorney. So I can be incapacitated, my son's gone through this process, he's got the doctor's letter, he takes it into Edward Jones, you know, along with the, the power of attorney, along with the letter, says, dad's incapacitated, I need access to his account to start paying his bills. They could say, eh, I'm not crazy about that form. I don't really like how old it is. Well, we're not gonna take it. It's up to them. They have no liability to not accept the power of attorney. So what does my son now do? Well, he is stuck, right? He cannot get access to any of those accounts without going to court, filing a petition to be appointed my guardian and conservator, and going through this long court process to have me officially declared incapacitated and have a guardian and conservator appointed for me. But that's, that's what he's gotta do. Now, I will tell you, 95% of the time, it's not an issue. The third party will accept the power of attorney. But every once in a while, you'll run across a bank or a title company if you're dealing with real estate or a brokerage house. For no reason, they just don't like it. They just won't take it. And when it's a problem, it's a big problem. So, but that's what I got with a will. I got this power of attorney to deal with incapacity. Contrast that to a trust. So in my trust, I can set the parameters by which whether I'm competent or not is determined. So quick example, in my trust it says, my wife, my brother, and my son, by majority vote, can declare me incapacitated. Now I've said, my wife has to be part of the majority if she's alive and serving on the panel. So my son and brother can, you know, together make that decision. She has to be part of it. But if they make that decision, I'm incapacitated for purposes of my trust, which means I'm removed as a trustee, and my wife continues now as the sole trustee. Or if she was gone, my son is now the trustee. Uh, so it, now I could have set it up however I wanted. I could have had these five people and they had the unanimously agree. I could have had two people and they had the unanimously agree. I have three and say it's majority. Uh, I could have still required a doctor's certification. I just think that's too cumbersome on my family to have to go out and try to make that, have that determination made. So there's a, can, can be a much expedited method for determining whether I'm incapacitated or not and removed as a trustee. And I've had this issue come up a number of times that goes back to the financial exploitation issue, where I've had the father in the family uh, have some cognitive problems, get targeted financially, was losing money, giving away money left and right, and the family was able to catch on to that, 
step in, make the decision, get a removed as trustee, and stop that financial leak. Uh, but the second part is, if I am, and now, it's not a legal determination that I'm incapacitated. It's not even a medical determination I'm incapacitated. But for purposes of my trust, which is just this contract, it says that's how it works. All right? Now, obviously, I've got to have trust and confidence in the people I pick to make the decision, and I do. Uh, but that's how it works for determining the incapacitated. But the second part is, if I am incapacitated, and my trust now owns all of my assets, right? My son or my wife, they don't have to rely on a power of attorney and the potential risk that a third party will not honor that power of attorney. Because any assets that are owned by the trust, and again, let's say my wife is gone, I'm incapacitated, and my son steps up as trustee. Well, whatever the trust owns, he just steps right into my shoes. He controls everything the trust owns now. Now he's got to follow the directions I've laid out for him in the trust, which is take care of me as the incapacitated person. But he doesn't have to mess around with his power of attorney and the risk that it might not be on him. So I still need a power of attorney when I have a trust for two reasons. One, even if all my assets are owned by my trust, one type of asset that cannot be is my IRA, right, my retirement plan. So let's say I'm incapacitated and the investment allocation in my IRA needs to change. I need more bonds, less stocks, less international funds, whatever it is. Well, they won't talk to my son as trustee of my trust because it's not owned by the trust. So in that case, Right? He's got to use that power of attorney, which says he can deal with my retirement plans and IRAs. Uh, and again, anything that's personal to me. He's got to talk to the Social Security Administration. Right? There's been some screw up in my payments. They won't talk to him as trustee. They'll talk to him as agent under the power of attorney. So I still need that power of attorney, just not nearly as much as if I do not have a trust. Okay, any questions about that? I have a question. It's not really about that. It's a general question. No, I'm afraid not. Okay. That's, uh, no, no. General, questions, general are questions are fine. Okay, general question about will. I have a will in California. I've lived most of my life. Is that will good here? You're a big trouble. <laughs> no. Now, look, here's, here, here, here's the issue. Wills, in particular, and trusts as well, are pretty much valid in any state you move to, right? So as long as it's valid in California, it's valid here. If I have a trust in California, it's valid here, right? The things that tend to be more state-specific are these financial powers of attorney and medical directives, and we'll talk about those in a minute. But those things tend to be much more state-specific uh, than my trust or my will. Uh, so. But yeah, it's good if it's from California. As long as, long as it was valid there. Yeah, it was. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, One more question. Oh, sorry. Yeah. If, if someone's listed as a beneficiary of the IRA, mm -hmm. then they have the right to the power of attorney surrounding distributions from IRAs changed dramatically January 1 of 2020. Um, and here, here's what I mean by that. So a surviving spouse, well, let me, let me back it up. Uh, under the new rules, right, I do not have to start taking money out of my IRA till I'm 72 now. Right? It used to be 70 and a half, now it's 72. When I do start taking money out, when I do have to start taking money out, uh, it's based on my life expectancy. So, you know, I have to take a little bit out each year based on my life expectancy, uh, which is an actuarial table. It's not just me personal actual life expectancy, which you know, God knows what that is. Um, if I die, I own an IRA, my spouse inherits it, 
She has one of two choices. She can roll it over into her own IRA, in which case the normal rules apply. If she's not yet 72, she does not have to start taking money out. At 72, she has to start. After 59 and a half, she can take money out without penalty. Or she can take it as what's called an inherited IRA, which means instead of it being in wife's name, it's in my name for the benefit of wife. In an inherited IRA, she has to start taking money out the next year, regardless of how old she is. So she could be 40, all right? She inherits my IRA, she takes it as an inherited IRA, not as a rollover. She has to start taking money out the following year, based on her life expectancy, which at 40 is a long time. So the amounts that she has to take out are not huge each year. She can always take more out, she doesn't have to take out of a large amount. Um, well, well, why would she do that? Well, if she needed the income, right, then if she's 40, she couldn't take money out of the IRA if she rolled it over without paying a penalty, because she's not 59 and a half yet. Uh, so if she needed the income, she needed the money, she could take it as an inherited IRA. Well, it used to be the rules for non-spouse beneficiaries were similar, with one big exception. A non-spouse beneficiary, my son, he cannot roll it over in his own IRA. He has to take it as an inherited IRA, period. Non-spouse beneficiaries, IRA beneficiaries cannot do a rollover. The way the rule changed was it used to be he would then have to take out money the following year after my death based on his life expectancy. So if he was 40 at the time, he'd only have to take out a little bit each year. The rest could continue to grow tax deferred. Well, as part of this change in 2020, uh, non-spouse beneficiaries have to take out the entire account balance over no more than 10 years, period. Now, they could wait till year 10 and take it all out. They could take it all out in year one. They could take out a little bit each year. It doesn't matter. But it has to be all taken out over no more than 10 years. Can they not roll it into their own? Uh, but they have immediate access to it. So what would happen is, you know, I die, my son's the beneficiary of my IRA, and it's with uh, Merrill Lynch. So he goes into Merrill Lynch with my death certificate. They set up an inherited IRA account for him and just move the uh, assets over into the inherited IRA. Then he now has access to it. But he has to pay taxes. When he withdraws it. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Still. yeah, still taxable upon withdrawal. Even if it's a Roth? Not a Roth. Yeah, ten year rule still applies. Who knows why? Because there's no tax on the distribution, but still has to be taken out over ten years. But uh, but yeah, no tax. Yeah. You said that if he had a, uh, an IRA today, and he said if, if he had a will, you're saying they could set it up so that they could come in and take their portion out of, of the IRA. Totally different. So IRAs, qualified retirement plans, 401ks, you know, 403bs, whatever it is, are directed by the beneficiary designation on the plan itself. My will has no impact on it. My trust has no impact on it. Right? Unless I named my trust as a beneficiary of the IRA. Um, the only time my will would impact it is if on the IRA itself, I named my estate as the beneficiary. But I don't want to do that because if a non-individual is a beneficiary of an IRA, the 10-year rule doesn't apply. Now it's a five-year rule. So it all has to come out over five years. Um, but normally it's not going to be impacted by it at all because I would have named direct beneficiaries on the IRA itself. No, no, not at all. Well, the only thing that makes a difference is how I've set up my beneficiary designations on the IRA. Not in my will, not in my trust, but in the IRA itself. Does that make sense? So, for example, on my IRA, I would name 
my daughter 50%, my son 50%. Right? So would that mean that they are free of taxes because they are beneficiaries? Not for retirement plans or IRAs. Okay. Still have to pay tax as and when they withdraw the money from the IRA. Couldn't know tax has been paid on it yet, not yet, for non roth IRAs. Um, so the three people Well, depends. So and here's what depends on. Did I on the bank account name the three of them as pay on death beneficiaries? Because if I didn't, walking in with my will is gonna do them no good at all. They gotta go to court and open up a probate if I did not name them directly as pay on death beneficiaries on the bank account, right? Doesn't matter what my will says. I mean, it matters, but it only matters if I want to. bank account is that way. Because you can go into your bank account, yeah. you can put a $10 right. and, and, But they can't, you, you can't put them in the IRA is what you're saying. No, you can and should. You should do the same thing. Right, as the pay on death on the bank account. Okay. Right, right, you do the same thing with the IRA beneficiary designations. Okay, um, oh yeah. Well, the, Sorry, it? It, it, if something happened to you and, and you have a trust, right, <coughs> and she's the successor trustee to you, mm -hmm. she's going to need some legal help to do what she needs to do. That's why I told her. <laughs> yeah, I mean, she has to there, there's not a lot that needs to be done. I mean, let me, let me say this. When you have a trust you know, and then you die, it is much, much easier for your successor trustee to access assets, pay bills, distribute the property where it's gonna go, then if I have to do a probe, then they, they have to do a probate, right? There's still some legal things they need help with, but it's much, much simpler for them. Um, I, I'm probably running over time here, so last uh, thing I kind of want to talk about when it comes to leaving an inheritance to somebody, right, there's different ways I can do that, right? One way I can just say, upon my death, I got two kids, divide it 50-50 and just give it to them. It's now theirs. And that's fine to do. I can do that, as long as they're adults, right? At least over 18, although we probably don't want to leave an 18-year-old a bunch of money. Uh, but I could. And then, you know, you see these trusts out there that'll say things like, give them a third of their share at age 25 and maybe half of the rest at 30 and the rest at 35. Kind of the staggered distribution over time thinking, well, if they get a chunk at 25 and they just blow it, at 30 at least they got some more coming. Yeah, yeah that's fine to do as well. Um, a third option, and one we tend to do a lot of, are what I call lifetime protective trusts. So that means upon my death, my trust says, divide everything I own 50-50 between my two kids. But don't just give it to them, keep it in trust for them. Now, even if each child becomes their own trustee of their own share, so they control their inheritance, they can decide what to spend it on, how to invest it, they could still blow it if I make them their own trustee. But as long as they keep that inheritance inside of their trust, Nobody else can get to it. If they cause a car accident and get sued, it's not going to get touched. They get divorced, right? The daughter-in-law that I never much liked isn't going to get half of it. So I can protect it from anything bad happening to the inheritance. Even though my son, and by the way, I love my daughter-in-law, uh, even though my uh, son, as trustee, controls his own inheritance, he can still use it but his creditors can't get to it. Uh, so, so that's another way to do it. 
The downside of doing that is each of those trusts for my son and daughter are separate, irrevocable trusts. So they do have to get their own tax identification number. They do have to file an income tax return every year. Uh, was it a form uh, 1041? Right? Just like you know, we file a 1040, a trust files a 1041 income tax return. Um, now, I, I, depending on how much is involved, right? If, I, if I'm going to leave $10,000 to each of my kids, well, it probably doesn't make sense to keep it in trust for them. Right? If I've got several hundred thousand dollars to leave to them or more, well, maybe it does make sense to protect that in a trust, even though they got to pay, you know, an accountant five or six hundred bucks a year to do a tax return. So that's, that's a possibility as well. It's a way you can leave it. Now, you can do that same kind of thing in the last will and testament, but it makes for a very complicated will, and I've got to make sure all of my assets go through probate to get into those trusts for my kids under a will. I can't do the pay on death and you know, beneficiary designations to avoid probate, if I've created these protective trusts under my last will and test. Uh, yeah. Right, so in our practice, to, to do a living trust plan, uh, it starts at a base fee of $2,500. Uh, and if we do these protective trusts for kids or grandkids, it can go up to $3,500. If I just give it to them, still $2,500. To do a simple probate in today's dollars at an hourly rate usually costs uh, about $4,000 to get through in legal fees and court costs. It can be, though, much more in a probate. And part of the reason is, if anybody fights about it, your legal fees, well, not yours, you're gone. Your estate's legal fees become astronomical if there's a fight over the estate. And part of the downside of doing a probate is, it just makes it a whole lot easier to fight about because there's already a court proceeding sitting there. They can just jump into and fight, right? They don't have to go out and file a separate lawsuit, and go through this whole process to file a separate lawsuit. They just jump into the probate and they can fight about whatever they want. So that can make a probate much, much more expensive to get through. Yeah? Regarding uh, protecting against uh, creditors, is there a difference between an irrevocable trust Sure there is. So, and, and that's essentially what these trusts for my kids are. They're irrevocable trusts. So if I set up an irrevocable trust and I move assets into it that my kids and grandkids are beneficiaries of, it's got to have its own tax ID number, files its own income tax return. But if I get sued, creditors can't touch it. If any of they get sued, creditor, their creditors can't touch it. So it, yeah, it's protected within this irrevocable trust. But it has to be irrevocable. Yes. Okay. And I cannot be a beneficiary of it okay. if I've created it. Yeah. What happens to a single person that doesn't have any estate planning that will go away or Yes. Who gets their assets then? No, it, it, yeah, it would go to probate. You know, unless you've done pay on death to specific people on your accounts and a beneficiary deed for a house. But yeah, otherwise it goes through probate, and with no planning, Arizona state law says who inherits it. So, so how do you encourage somebody to do that? How do you encourage someone to do planning? Or are two single people that got assets? Maybe. You know, I'll tell you what, I, uh, I don't, that's a good question. Yeah. How do you encourage them? You, you encourage them by saying, if something happens to you, Nothing is going to happen the way you want it to or you think it's going to. All right? Uh, I'll give you a real quick example. 
uh, I was working with a couple, a married couple, about two months ago. They came in, they have this horrible older trust from California. Horrible just in the sense that it, it was so complex, so much more complicated than they needed. And it didn't give who they wanted to inherit the right things anymore. Uh, meaning the, the husband gave essentially half to a brother in the old trust, to a brother who had passed. So it went to that brother's kids, and they had had no contact with those kids for decades, and didn't much like them anyway. So they come in, we do this new plan, fixes everything, all the problems with the old one, gives everything to who they want it to go to. Uh, we go through it all, and at the end of the meeting, husband just wouldn't sign it. Just wouldn't do it. Flat wouldn't do it, didn't care. He didn't want to sign anything. So they left. He died two weeks later. Half of everything goes to these kids that none of them liked and nobody wanted anything to go to, and she, the wife, there's nothing she can do about it now. Uh, so, you know, those are the things that happen when you don't find it. Can yeah. you just clarify the trust ID number is, is issued after the death? Yes. So Not if, during the lifetime. Correct. So if I, unless I create an irrevocable trust at okay. the outset. Yes, I'm not talking about irrevocable. So during my life, my trust is revocable. Right? I can change it. After I die, it becomes irrevocable and then gets its own tax ID. Got it. Yeah. Uh, okay, very last thing I'll just mention. As part of any planning, it's important to do these healthcare directives, the healthcare power of attorney. If I can't make my own medical decisions, here's who makes them for me. A living will to describe whether I want to be kept alive artificially or not, which is not, by the way, a DNR, a do not resuscitate order, where it says if I have a heart attack, don't try to revive me. The living will is a true end of life. If I'm going to die anyway, and the only thing keeping me alive is this artificial life support, then pull the life support. Uh, and we do a HIPAA authorization that tells the medical world, you know, this is who you can talk to about my otherwise confidential information. Um, whether you do a will plan or a trust plan, you would want these medical directives as part of that plan. Yeah? Um, I created a will maybe 14 years ago, uh, and I'm thinking of creating a trust. Would that take precedence over the will? Yes. So let me, um, but here's why. When I create a trust, I still have a last will and testament. It's just a different kind of will. And that will, this new will, by the way, says, I revoke any and all prior wills I may have created. Um, it's a different kind of will in the sense that if I do not have a trust, my will says, here's who inherits upon my death. Well, when I have a trust, it's my trust that says that. So all my will says is, executor of my estate, I created a trust, and I sure meant to put everything I owned into the name of that trust while I was alive. But if I missed anything, your only job is to put it into the trust after I'm gone. We do not ever want to have to use that will, because anytime you got to use a will, you got to open a probate. But it's there as a backup to get everything into the trust if I missed anything. I mean, I, I heard a story in, not a bunch of years ago now, this guy that passed and he had his trust, everything was set up great, had $5 million sitting over in a, here in the county, just forgot about it. I'm still just in his name. So probate had to happen regardless. It was not my class. Okay. And this is also what you tell him, right? Having an estate plan doesn't mean you're gonna die. I, I tell you what, I, I argued about this issue for years with my father-in-law. He would not do a plan. He was convinced that as soon as he signed an estate plan, he was dead. He just was not gonna do it. Eventually he did, but uh, that was a tough sell. And it was free. I don't know what the heck you were worried about. Oh. All right, any final questions? Oh. Yeah. If I set up a replicable will, and I have, uh, when I die, I have two children, and they each, it, because they each become their own trust, trustee, and mm -hmm. keep that going, is that correct? Yep. Okay. Now if I've set it up that way. Okay, if I set it up that way. If, 
And as far as creditors go, is there any creditor that could get their money from the government? Not as long as they keep it in the trust. Well, and with one exception, right? If the trust does not pay tax that it owes, okay. the IRS could come after the trust for unpaid taxes the trust owes. Okay. Yeah. There's no government entity that could go after that? No. For child support or anything like that? Uh, you know, that's a good question. In a, I don't know the answer to that off the top of my head. In a general needs trust like that, I don't know. There may be a child support exception. I'd have to look at that. Anything else? Going, going, going? Well, thank you all. I appreciate it. I, I do want to see one more time your phone number. Oh, uh, so it's 480-345-8845. Uh, but let me give you an email address, because that's a lot of times easier and faster to contact me. It is uh, R. Adams, my last name, at halaw.com. That was R. Adams at halaw.com. Right. If you email me, just put in the subject line that you attended this event, so I know what it is. Well, I would like to thank all of you guys for coming, and I, judging by how many of you stayed, and you must have really learned something. And so this is the kind of events that we're going to do, and you're going to learn from the best people. And if you choose to have me do a comparable, comparative analysis for your house, the sign-ups are on the table in the back. And with that, you guys drive safe, have fun, and I appreciate you. See you next time.